an age of legend. Horrors and heroes, kings and common folk, all have their place in the colorful legends of Barsave. Legends unite the people of Barsave with their past and point the way toward their future. Inspired by legends, the heroes of Barsave fight to reclaim their world from the devastation of the Scourge and to free it from the remaining horrors. These heroes, in turn, spawn the legends that will inspire Barsave's future generations. The Love of Tunla and Inard Long ago, there lived a great warrior named Tunla. He fought in many great wars that destroyed many kingdoms and saw many other realms rise from the blood he helped spill on the battlefield. He fought and killed creatures so terrible that we can no longer imagine them. The venomous Chris Crata, the ravening Dargomond, and the hissing Vandrake. His name became feared throughout the land, and all knew him as a man of terrible temper who grabbed what he wanted and made no apologies to those weaker than he. Tonla had known many women in his day, but none had won his heart. Then one day, as the great warrior traveled to the city of Uajnul to fight a duel against the city's twin sorcerer kings, he happened to pass a great estate on the outskirts of a town called Barhurst. Through the gates of the plantation, he saw several young women playing a game of Vrasti on the lawn. The youngest of these women looked at Tunla as he passed, and in that instant he was racked by love. Setting aside his planned vengeance against the sorcerer kings, Tunla sent a letter of introduction to the owner of the estate, a wealthy nobleman, Brandor by name. Brandor, fearing Tunla's reputation, admitted him immediately to his estate and fawned over him as a lapdog fawns on its master. Whatever Tonla wanted, Brandor would give him, even if Tonla happened to desire one of Brandor's lovely daughters. Indeed, Brandor was ready to give Tonla all of them, if such a gift meant that he need not fear the great warrior's anger. But the young woman Tonla loved, whose name was Inard, was not so easily persuaded. Though she loved him the moment she looked on him, and knew she would gladly live by his side forever, she saw no reason to give up her only chance to be extravagantly courted. Indeed, many young men other than Tonla were seeking Inard's hand, and she wished to see how well the handsome warrior would do against all the others. If Tonla wished to win her, he would have to woo her. Now, Inard was a witty young girl and wanted to be wooed by a man of subtle words. But Tonla was a man of actions and expected to sweep Inard away. Inard refused to be swept, and Tonla grew impatient and angry. Raising a company of ferociously loyal mercenaries and bandits, Tonla laid siege to Barhurst and slew many of its defenders. But Dinard did not give in. Instead, she sent messages to her many other princely suitors, asking them to send their own armies against Tonla. Like the great warrior he was, Tonla beat back the first of these armies, but the struggle to defeat this foe cost Tonla half his men. So Tonla demanded, and received, new soldiers from the many barons and princelings who owed him favors for destroying threats to their realms. He led this larger army against all who came against him, and after much death and suffering on both sides, the armies of Inard's suitors fell back. But once again, Inard did not give in. She had grown to like the smell of blood, and so she trained her own people as mighty fighters and led them herself onto the field of battle. Meanwhile, the barons and princelings that Tonla had once aided saw their finest fighters dying like dogs and grew reluctant to give him more. No longer able to demand what he wanted from them, Tonla learned to persuade. The great warrior became witty and wise, learning to wield the weapons of blackmail, intrigue, and a quick tongue in the same way that Inard had learned the catapult and the arbalest. As Tonla fought to retain his army, troops of romantic men from all around the world flocked to Inard's side ready to die to defend her honor. The siege of Barhurst continued for twelve years, three months, and four days, until the last few bedraggled fighters on each side slew one another, leaving Tonla and Dinard alone on the field of battle. Their fighting done, the two lovers fell into one another's arms and lived in bliss forever. Indeed, it is said their passions ran so strong that Tonla and Dinard never died, but live and love even to this day. Thank you. 
Justice of Horrors. It was a busy day at the bazaar. Hawker's cries filled the air, along with a thousand heady smells, from rare perfumes to grilled meats. Behind one of a dozen snack stalls stood a pair of ragged fellows, a grimy dwarf with a wandering eye, and a young human with a peg leg. The human reached forward to flip the greasy-looking fish cakes on their sizzling grill. What do you mean, Borelica? There's worse things to be than lousy fish cake sellers. The human complained. I can't think of nothing. You isn't thinking hard enough, then, Guando, said the dwarf, settling back onto a stool. There's justices, isn't there? Justicers? I'd give anything to be. You know how rich they is, Borelica? Sure they's rich. Borelica leaned forward to whisper in Guando's ear. But they's evil. Most of them is monsters in disguise. Horrors. You's pulling my leg again, Borelica. You's got no leg to pull, I tells you truth. Tall goes back to long ago times, Guando. See, there was this elf queen. Her name was Elf Queen. They's all real fine, isn't they? Shut up and listen to the story, Guando. Maybe you'll learn something. This elf queen, Minelius, she was smarter and stronger than anybody. She united all the races together. Us dwarfs, you humans, orcs, even all them squabbling trolls she united together. So all boss save was all together. One big kingdom. Everybody happy. Everybody got food to eat, right? So everybody happy for years. Till finally, even Minelius has to die. So she be lying on her deathbed, wondering which of her children to give boss save to. Trouble is, all of them's good choices. Oldest son, Reductil, he's a mighty archer. He protect Bosse from its enemies. Her oldest daughter, Factivia, very smart. She know all the best ways to win wars. The middle son, True Atemel. Everybody love him and want to follow him. The youngest daughter, Falskadil, she's got real good magics. And the youngest son, I forget his name, he knew all the secrets of the olden times that happened even back before the olden times. So she lies there dying and worrying, and along comes this elf, tall and fine with his real smart look in her eyes. And the elf says, Never fear, Queen Minelius. I know the answer because I am a justicer. Minelius says, Justicer? What's that? Because this was the olden times, before justicers even were invented. This woman, Leroyd, that's her name, was the first one. She says, I will devise a just solution for your problem. So Leroyd tells Minelius to chop Barsave up into five pieces, Give one pot to each child, so each gets to be king or queen of their piece of the land. Now, this don't sound too bad, because Boss save pretty big place, right? So Minelius agrees, and she dies, and the children get a piece of the land, and they all get along fine. Well, there's a few little wars between Reductil and Vectivia. A few people killed, but nothing too big. Mostly there's happiness all around still. But then the new kings and queens get old and die. And they have the same problem. They all got bunches of heirs to decide from. And even though some of them's kids not so smart this time, they all wants to take over their parents' kingdoms. And one by one, as the kings and queens die off, Leroyd shows up at each one's deathbed, saying, Never fear, I have the answer, because I am a justicer. And she tells each queen and king to divide the kingdoms up between their children. So pretty soon, Barsave goes from one kingdom to five kingdoms to twenty-three kingdoms. So this keeps going on for many years. Each time a ruler dies, all the children divide up the land, so there's more and more kingdoms getting smaller and smaller. One king, great-grandson of Factivia, he thinks Leroyd's idea stinks, and he has a contest between his children over who gets to keep his kingdom, and makes them all promise never to split their kingdom up into bits like all the others are doing. So finally, after many, many years, there's this one big kingdom left. Well, big compared to the other ones now. This kingdom of lesser Factivia. And all the other kingdoms in Bosse have got just one person in them, Everybody's a king and nobody a subject. So everything gets all confused. And since everybody's a ruler, even the smallest arguments turn into wars. So they are smiting and killing all over. And nobody has an army or nothing except for the Queen of Lesser Factivia. Then the Justicer Leroyd shows up to the Queen of Lesser Factivia. And Queen says, you can't make me change to your ways. You see the ruin you brought to Barsave, which was once united all together and full of peace and happiness? And Leroyd says... Of course I see the ruin I brought, for that was my plan. I'm not an elf, I'm a horror. My kin from beyond this world set me ahead to sow discord and disaster among you before they come to lay waste to your world. That's why I invented justicers, and now you die. 
and so Leroyd shucked off her skin. She looked like a giant crayfish with a thousand sloping mouths. She cut the queen of less effectivity to bits and devoured her right there on the spot, while her courtiers all looked on with her jaws hanging all out. And the horrors came and killed everyone easy, with no armies to put up a fight and no unity to inspire courage. And that's why you should never trust justicers, Guando. The first one of them was a horror, and we all know there's still horrors about, so any justicer you meet might be a monster in disguise. The human frowned, scratched his head, and pulled at his lower lip, as if these gestures would set his slow brain to working. After a long few minutes, he turned to his dwarf companion. I got just one question, Berelica. If the horrors ate everybody in lesser effectivia, who was left for that story to be remembered? Shut up, Guando. You don't understand nothing about legends. The Heart of Heroes Gaze up at the night sky, my gracious friends, and marvel at the constellations hanging there. The hunter, the mountain, the great oak, the air dancer, the butterfly, the horse, the ship, the sleeping warrior, and the winged snake. All familiar, yet all wondrous, these gems of the sky each point the way toward the heart of heroes. The heart of heroes holds within it the nine true names, each name the essence of a noble name-giver race. Without our names, we would be as the animals, ephemeral as soap bubbles, unable to make a mark upon our world. Only by the shaping of our own patterns, our own destinies, can we forge the destiny of our people and our world. And among all the true names of our universe, the nine true names of the heart of heroes are shining beacons to light the dim path of destiny, shimmering swords to cut to the heart of the universe's secrets, miraculous healing balms to right the greatest wrongs. In times long past, eons before the terrors of the scourge, nine heroes placed the secrets of their names within a magical treasure, greater and more powerful than any the world has seen before or since. This magical treasure is the heart of heroes, forged of purest orichalcum and imbued with the essences of the nine adventurers who created it. These heroes embodied the truest, best qualities of each of the name-giver races. Indeed, it is said that the exploits of these nine adventurers shaped the natures of each name-giver race for all time to come. The nine true names are the first names of us all, and therein lies their tremendous power. The heart of heroes is beautiful beyond anything else in existence, the smile of an innocent child, the strains of the sweetest love song, the brilliant grace of the rising sun on the clearest day. All these things are as withered leaves beside the beauty of the heart. The heart of heroes fits within a troll's palm, and in it the adventurers carved nine filigreed holes. Each one of the nine keys to the heart holds the secret of one of the nine true names, and can release that secret to the holder of that key. When these great heroes created the heart and its keys, each of them swore to hide their key in a place known only to them. They left us clues to the hiding places in ancient poems and songs, so that we, their descendants, may uncover and use the power of the nine names in our hour of need. No one knows where the keys are now, nor where the heart lies hidden, but the universe itself gave us the most valuable clue of all, the very stars above our heads. Ninety-nine days after the heart of a heroes was forged, each of the nine adventurers vanished from Barsave. On that same night, sages and wizards saw for the first time the nine constellations that to our eyes are so dear. The hunter, stars of the humans. The mountain, stars of the dwarves. The ship, stars of the Tuscrang. The great oak, stars of the elves. The air dancer, stars of the trolls. The butterfly, stars of the windlings. The horse, stars of the orcs. The sleeping warrior, stars of the obsidian, And the winged snake, that some call the stars of the dragons. The Horror Storm The great city of Tesora, in the ancient kingdom of Landis, was once renowned for its magic. Elementalists, wizards, and magicians of all kinds came to Tesora to learn and teach, and the city grew and prospered. And when the scourge drew nigh, and all the world cowered in terror of what was to come, the folk of Tesora said, We are not afraid. 
The greatest magicians in all Barsave live within our walls. We will build a citadel so mighty that no horror can breach it. And so they did. The citadel of Tesora was a marvel to behold. Its stone towers reached high into the sky, and its walls stood a mile thick. A huge, shimmering dome of elemental air enclosed it, and the people within felt as safe and comforted as a child wrapped in its mother's arms. The first hundred years of the Scourge passed without incident for Tesora. The few horrors that tried to breach the dome and the walls all failed and died. And the people of Tesora smiled, because these attempts proved they had nothing to fear. Only one magician said otherwise, Varena, the most learned elementalist in the Citadel. Varena warned the people to be ever vigilant and not to forget that horrors might come in many guises. A year and a day passed by, and then one day the sky above the citadel began to darken. Storm clouds gathered, black and threatening. Then the sky opened with a searing flash of light and a crack, as if the very earth had split in two, and the rain came pouring down upon the dome of elemental air. A dark and foul rain that burned the dome wherever it fell. Storm winds shrieked and howled and tore at the dome, and lightning bolts sizzled and cracked against the citadel's defenses. And the people of Tesora saw that this was no ordinary tempest, but a storm of horrors, and for the first time, many of them knew fear. Only Verena was not afraid. She had raised the dome to protect the citadel, and she knew a way to use the same magic to end the storm of horrors. Taking a piece of purest crystal the size of a troll's fist, Verena performed a dangerous rite of blood magic and trapped the horror storm within the stone. When the last word was spoken and the last gesture made, the clear crystal had turned the color of smoke, lit from within by occasional flashes of lightning. The people of Tesora rejoiced and praised Verena as their savior. But Verena knew she had won only a temporary victory. In secret, she performed the same rite of blood magic once every year to keep the horror storm within the crystal, she grew weaker and weaker each time. When she grew too weak to keep the storm bound, she passed the crystal to her apprentice, who likewise performed blood magic to bind the horror storm. And so down all the years of the scourge, those who followed in Verena's footsteps guarded the crystal and kept the horror storm trapped within it. In the final century of the scourge, the guardian of the crystal discovered a way to use its magic to strengthen the dome of elemental air. The mage used the power of the horror storm itself to protect Tesora from the other horrors that threatened it. And though the horror storm tried mightily to taint the minds and hearts of the guardians who used its power, not one of them succumbed to the horror's touch. Not one of them ever turned aside from the true path of the protector. At long last, the scourge ended, and the magicians of Tesora opened the dome for the first time in four hundred years. And the people wept for joy because they need not fear the horrors any more. No one was more joyful than Tigana, guardian of the crystal. With the ending of the scourge, Tesora no longer needed the power of the horror storm to protect it, and so Tigana sought a way to destroy the horror storm forever. For many months she studied, always alone. Then one day, Tigana and the crystal disappeared from Tesora. Some say the horror storm corrupted the last guardian. Others say Tigana destroyed the crystal and herself, but no one has seen them since, and no one knows their fate. The Brightest Star in the Sky Look up at the stars, wheeling and turning in their endless dance in the skies of Barsave. Look at them and marvel, in memory of the time not so long ago when the peoples of the world could see nothing overhead but the blackness of rock and soil. Most of all, look into the sky and see the brightest star of all. This star is named Findes's Flight, and the story of its birth is full of wonder. Nonan Findes was an elementalist, among the greatest magicians of his time. He was a Theron, but a good and decent man for all that. It was Findes who studied the magics of elemental earth and gave the world the knowledge of how to build cares as protection against the horrors. Yet Findus himself forswore this protection, fearing that it would not be enough. Findus knew that a shield of elemental earth would keep the horrors at bay, but he also saw that all the cares and citadels built on or under the earth had one weakness. Such shelters shared the world with the horrors. 
and though the magic could repel them, it was possible that over many years the horrors could simply batter down the care walls as a thief batters down the locked door of a house. Findus's fears were well-founded, as every name-giver in Barsave knows. So even as the peoples of the world rushed to build cares and citadels, Findus turned to his studies and sought a way to build a care high above the earth, where the horrors that roamed the land could not touch it. Before too long, Findus found a way to make the heavy stone and earth of a care float high above the ground, as if it was as light as a feather in the wind. He spoke to many Theron nobles, seeking funds with which to build, and found many ears willing to listen to his words. Together, Findus and the nobles built their stone care, racing against the dwindling sands of time. For the horrors were coming in greater and greater numbers, and the dawning of the scourge was drawing near. At last, the care was finished, and those who had built it moved their families and possessions inside. And Findus went to the Theron noble who had first agreed to aid him, and said, After you have gone in, I will seal the care shut. Then I will perform the magic that will send it into the sky. The noble thanked Findus and walked toward the care, then stopped as he realized that Findus was not behind him. He turned to look at the magician, saying, Why are you still standing there? Make haste and come inside! I am not coming with you, said Findus, his voice serene and his eyes full of sadness. To perform the magic that will launch the care above the earth, I must stand upon the soil and draw its magic into my body. I cannot do it from behind the care's walls. The noble bowed before Findus, saying, All our generations will remember that we owe our lives to your sacrifice. By all the passions, this I swear. And he went into the care, his heart heavy with sorrow. As soon as the noble had gone inside, Findus spoke the words of power to seal the care. Then he raised his arms and began to chant the song of power to raise the care above the earth. The song raised a great storm, and the sky above turned dark. And Findus stood in the midst of the tempest, working his magic, watching the care rise higher and higher. The song that Findus sang has been lost to the mists of time, and no one knows if any horrors ever touched the floating care. But if you look into the night skies of western Barsave, by the shores of the Celestrian Sea, the brightest star that shines is said to be the care that Findus built. The Pipes of Wrongness Barsave has survived the scourge, but the horrors left their evil mark all across the land and on all of its people. Hearken to the tale of Elena and the Pipes of Wrongness, and know that the battle against the horrors has only just begun. Elena was a windling troubadour of great skill, who traveled the land with her human partner and friend, Delphina. Delphina had a sweet voice, and Elena could play any musical instrument as if she had been born with it in her hand. They performed it together at many a gathering, and shared all their hardships, joys, and secrets. Sometimes they told stories, sometimes they danced, and sometimes they sang. During their travels one year, they came to a village deep in Barsave's wilds. The village folk greeted them warily, and only with great difficulty did Elena persuade them to shelter her and Delphina for the night. Elena would have passed the village by, but Delphina was weary. Both of them were hungry, and neither wished to dare the uncertain perils of a dark night in the open. So the two troubadours entered the village and ate with its people around the evening fire. As payment for their food, Elena and Delphina began to sing an ancient song of Thrall, giving thanks for a bountiful harvest. But their simple song, rather than putting the villagers at ease, only seemed to frighten them. At the end of the song, the village headwoman hustled the troubadours to their beds in her own barn, and no one spoke a word to them as they left the fireside. When Elena and Delphina woke the next morning, all the villagers had gone to their fields. Not one had remained to bid them a courteous farewell. The troubadours walked away from the village, and as they walked, Elena's uneasiness grew. They rested beside a stream, and when Elena opened her pack to remove a piece of bread, she knew what had caused her feeling. There, on top of her clothing and provisions, lay a set of pipes, beautifully wrought of pewter and covered with delicate runes. Elena picked them up, and they felt cold to her touch. Suddenly, she wanted to blow them, to hear their melody. This desire frightened her, for she had felt a horror taint in the chill metal 
and knew that such an act could only bring evil upon them. Elena brought out the food, saying nothing of the pipes. Later, when Delfina washed her face in the stream, Elena hid the pipes under a small rock. Many days later, while journeying between two towns in the hinterlands, Elena and Delfina met three rough orcs. All rode fine horses and led a dozen more that bore saddle and tackle worthy of a prince. Their leader, a large orc with battered plate armor and a broken tusk, called to the two troubadours, saying, Buy a fine steed and rest your weary feet. Only a hundred silver pieces. A bargain. Delfina answered, I am very fond of the orc delicacy of roasted horse hearts with hazelnut sauce. It seems to me your horses are hot enough to serve. This angered the orcs, for it showed that Delfina knew the horses were stolen. As one, the orcs rushed upon the troubadours with drawn swords. Delfina drew her own sword, and Elena readied her dagger. Then she reached into her pack for the second dagger she always carried, and her fingers closed around the cold pewter pipes. Before Elena could throw the pipes away, the orcs were upon them. The troubadours fought fiercely and slew one of the orcs, but the two others wore them down. Elena saw that Delfina was bleeding from a dozen small wounds, and she knew that her friend's strength would not last much longer. Suddenly, she felt an overwhelming desire to blow on the pipes. A voice seemed to whisper in Elena's ear that only the magic of the pipes could save Delfina. As if in a trance, Elena raised the pipes to her lips. The shriek of the pipes split the air, yet it seemed that only Elena could hear it. Delfina and the two orcs fought on, unheeding. Suddenly, a horror the size of an ox appeared, bloated and gray with blood-red tentacles that dripped green ichor. It seized both orcs and thrust them into its gaping mouth. Elena shouted to Delfina to run, but Delfina was transfixed with terror. Too late, she took a step away. The horror flicked its tentacles around her and dragged her, screaming and struggling, into its dreadful maw. Sick with fear and shame, Elena dropped the pipes and flew away. She did not stop until sunset, and only then because weariness forced her. Desperate for a crumb of food, she opened her pack and saw the pipes nestled inside. No matter how hard she tried, Elena could not rid herself of the pipes. She threw them to the bottom of her deep ravine, dropped them over the side of a Descrang river boat in the deepest part of the Serpent River, hurled them from the deck of an airship and dashed them to pieces on the teeth of the Dragon Mountains. But still, they reappeared in her pack, gleaming and cold and beautiful. In despair, Elena traveled deep into the wilderness where no name-giver lived, and there she blew on the pipes. She closed her eyes, expecting to feel the hot breath of the horror as it came to devour her, just as it had devoured Delfina. The shriek of the pipes died away, but nothing happened. Elena opened her eyes. No horror lurked nearby, and all seemed tranquil. Elena buried her head in her hands and sat still for a long time. When she looked up, she saw a man before her. He was old and thin, with sunken cheeks and lank white hair. His skin hung on his body as if there were no flesh between it and his bones. Graveyard earth covered his tattered clothes. Too deep in despair to feel any fear of this apparition, Elena asked him his name. I am Jamis, he said. I am a gift from Fla Trali, the eater of music. I will serve you faithfully for a year and a day. For that time, I am your slave. You may beat me or starve me, but I must serve you. You may drive me away, but I will return to serve you. If you slay me, my body will rise from the dead, and as it rots, it will serve you. After a year and a day, Flatrali will claim me. The horror will sweep over us both like the fall of night. You will sink into the ground, sleeping as though dead. And in that sleep, dreams will come. Dreams of the eater of music. You will not awaken until the pipes of wrongness summon you. Then you will be as I am, the slave of the fool who made the horror's music. So it shall be until the end of time. With a strangled cry, Elena hurled the pipes of wrongness as far from her as she could. Then she unsheathed her dagger and buried it in her own heart. No soul has seen the pipes of wrongness since that day, though some have heard their cold scream in the depths of the darkest nights. <music> New 
new sun in a new sky. In the days when the Spirit Mother made all things, a child was born to Tishlom, the sun, and Sirtis, the moon. This child was named Hern, and for many years she lived all alone, enclosed in a milk-white shell. Hern did not know her parents, or the Spirit Mother, or her uncle Shivos the Earth, or her aunt Shivom, the Serpent River. Hern knew only herself and the shell that surrounded her. In time, the loneliness made Hern sick with belly gas. Hern's body grew larger and larger until the milk-white shell burst. Then Hern's body became the sky, shaped like the milk-white shell and enclosing all the world within it. The world lived in darkness under Hern, the sky shell. All the grandchildren of the spirit mother lived in darkness. The dragons, the windlings, the tuskrang, the obsidimen, and the other races who came later. They could not see the sun nor the moon, for the sky shell hid these things from them. Now the river of time flowed onward, as all rivers do, whether we wish them to or not. And in time, the clever Rosserus was hatched and grew to become a great merchant. Rosserus traded with everyone who lived on the banks of the Serpent River, and her travels brought her knowledge of many wondrous things. But she never saw or heard of anything so wondrous as the ancient tales of the sun and moon. Well, before very long, Rosserus had traded with every single soul near the Serpent River, and she needed new customers. In search of them, Rosserus sailed her trading boat to the very edge of the world. There, the prow of her boat bumped against the sky shell. The sky shell shrieked in pain, and a platter-sized chip of black shell as thin as paper fell on the ship's deck. Ten thousand pardons, said Rosserus. May I express my inestimable regret at the injury I have caused you? By the honor of my name, Rosserus of the trade winds, I swear to you that my offense was inadvertent. I do not care to know your name, grumbled the sky shell. You are the first being other than myself that I have spoken to for millennia, and you have hurt me. If you wish to make up for it, you will go away. Be gone. This rudeness angered Rosserus, and she ceased to feel sorry for having harmed the sky shell. Her pride had told her to leave in silence, but through the hole in the sky shell she saw a patch of bright blue. Rosserus loved all new and amazing things, and her curiosity overwhelmed her. Rosserus wanted very much to see the blueness beyond the shell, for perhaps the sun and moon lay within it. At once she began to think of some scheme that would let her see more. I shall depart with a fair wind, Rosserus said, bowing, if you will first permit me to make some gesture to of amends for my clumsiness. I have an ointment that seamlessly mends all breaks, dries quickly without odor, and costs but a pittance when purchased in quantity. By way of demonstration, allow me to repair the breach I made. The sky shell thought for a time, then said, That sounds fair. Proceed with haste. Rosserus picked through her cargo and took up the first bottle to hand, a pewter flask of Mirthion liquor. She smeared a few drops of Mirthion around the edges of the fallen shard, then climbed on the rim of her boat and fitted the shard back into place. Of course, it fell straight back onto the deck. Wretched word, Weasel! The sky shell snapped. Can you do no better than that? Patience, patience, said Rosserus smoothly. I had forgotten the necessity of applying a base coat to your other side first. The base coat will anchor the broken piece, you see. And before the sky shell could say another word, Rosserus leaped nimbly through the hole. Clinging to the jagged break in the vast white dome, she looked and gasped in amazement at the blue sky, the clouds, and the burning golden glory of the sun. Lay your base coat and return inside, sounding petulant and uneasy. Certainly, said Rosserus. Swiftly she poured a thin stream of Mirthion around the edges of the hole and smeared the liquor around. Then, drawing her dagger, she said, Now I must reshape the hole to allow an easier fit. Rosserus placed her blade against one edge of the hole and slashed downward. The sky shell screeched and shook, nearly throwing Rosserus off into the air. Quickly, Rosserus climbed back through the hole, clinging to the edges with both feet in one hand. With her other hand, she turned the blade of her dagger to just the right angle, and then she slid slantwise down the sky shell, cutting a line through it as she fell. 
The shell's agonized shrieks followed Rosser's all the way down, until she landed in the splash on the shore of the endless ocean. Rosserus looked up and saw a million cracks spreading across the sky shell. The air echoed with the sky shell's fading death scream. Then, in a finger snap, the black shell shivered into shards, and the shards became dust, falling as grains of sand across the world. <laughs>